The Reds hitting the road here for some interleague action in Baltimore. Camden Yards will take on the Baltimore Orioles here. On the hill for them will be their top prospect, or one of them in Grayson Rodriguez, making his 22nd start. And on the hill for us will be the right-hander, Luis Castillo, making his 22nd start here for Cincinnati. Take a look at the Reds lineup on the day, listed 1-2-9. We'll start things off bottom half of the first inning. Nobody out, leading off the game for the Orioles is Cedric Mullins hitting one past Nick Senzel at third base. That's going to be a leadoff single for him. And then it would be Gunnar Henderson, one of the best names in baseball, blooping one into left field. First and second now, nobody out. And Ramon Urias grands into a 5-4-3 double play. So now there's two down, runner on third base. And unfortunately, Castilla would not get out of it. As then Ryan Mountcastle, one of their all-stars this season, hits one down the right field line. That's an RBI double and a 1-0 Orioles lead to start things off. So top of the second now, Joey Votto is going to ground one right back up the middle. And that is a base knock for the Reds. Next batter up, Tyler Stevenson. Powers went out to right center field here. It looks like it's going to be off the wall at least, but it's actually caught. And Votto thought it was going to be off the wall too. So he ends up getting caught on the bases. And they don't even step on the bag. They slap the tag on him trying to get back. Be an extra cocky with it. So now top of the third. And Jorge Mateo bloops one into right, right field. And just take a look at this. I mean, Yakety Sack should be playing over this. They throw it away, then they're going back to second. Oh no, I don't know what to do, going back to first, and then they throw it away again! And then Mateo gets into second base with one out, and then proceeds to go and swipe third base as well to get himself into 90 feet away from home plate with one out, but unfortunately the bottom half of the order would not be able to do it. Kiermaier goes down swinging, and then Birdie, the top of the order, grounds one out to first or third base. And it's still a 1-0 lead for the Orioles. Bottom of the fourth now, as it's going to be Austin Hayes grounding into a 3-6-1 double play to end the fourth inning. Bottom of the fifth, how about another ground ball worked by Luis Castillo, 4-6-3 that time. Then it's two outs, runner on third. And it would be Lockridge going down on the up and in fastball to end the fifth. Score is still 1-0. We're now to the top of the sixth inning where John Birdie continues to hit this season. Right field bloops one in for a base knock to lead off the inning. Then he goes and shows off the fleet feet as he goes and swipes second base to get himself into scoring position. Now Jonathan India whiffs on a pitch and that's going to be a drop third strike. So one down, runner on second. J.D. Martinez proceeds to do what he does. Hits a ball into center field, RBI single, ties the game at one. He drives in the tying run. On to the bottom of the sixth now. Cedric Mullen leads off the inning with a walk, so he'll take first base. Then Gunnar Henderson lays down a bunt, and that is actually going to be a bunt single as they try to go to second with it for some reason. So first and second here, nobody out. Then it is Urias hitting a ball down the third base line. That'll score Mullins from second base, and the Orioles are back on top 2-1. to one. So now Justin Dunn entering the game out of the bullpen here for Cincinnati. Two on, nobody out. Ground ball to Senzel, 5-4-3 around the horn. Another third base, two out situation here for the Orioles, and they deliver. A ground ball past the diving glove of Jorge Mateo, and they tack on two in the inning to make it a 3-1 ball game. They would take that lead into the top of the ninth where Dylan Tate came on, and Nick Senzel tried to end it with one swing of the bat on the hanging slider, but instead it is just going to be popped up to deep left center field as the Orioles hang on and win this game over the Reds by a score of 3-1 to one here as they defend their home of Camden Yards on a rainy night here in Baltimore. Player of the game honors go to Grayson Rodriguez, the young right-hander for the Orioles. Pitched six innings strong, struck at five Reds batters, only gave up one run. Luis Castillo opposed him with five innings, eight hits giving up, four Ks, three walks, three runs. Not his best outing, but also not the worst. The offense just could not pick him up. Jorge Mateo went two for three in the day with that hilarious hit that he had, and also two stolen bases. And then Ryan Mountcastle went two for four with a double for Baltimore. And now before we hop into the next game, it is time to take a look at what happened at the trade deadline. The Reds obviously unloading pieces. Let's just hop straight into it. Tyler Malley, Will Smith, and Aristides Aquino 
all were sent as a three-man package to the Los Angeles Angels in return for a three-man package of Joe Adele, Matt Feiss, and Landon Marceau. The Angels are currently a second-place team. They are nine games back in the NL West, still could make a run of that division, but they are currently the top team in the wild card. So they are sitting as a playoff team right now, obviously a team that would be looking to improve at the deadline. And they get a starting pitcher who is having a great season in Tyler Malley. Angels could always add a pitcher to that team, get a solid reliever as well in Will Smith. While Aristide as a keynote is more of just a change of scenery guy, we aren't going to use him. He's not really going to fit into our plans here. Might as well trade him while he has sort, still sort of some value because he does still have pop, does have the arm. He is a guy who could figure things out at some point, and he's going to go see if he can figure things out with the Angels. While we get the main piece of the trade was Joe Adele, super fast, got some pop in his bat. Not the best plate skills, but he's still only 23 years old, still can do some developing. He actually went to Louisville, so not too, too far away from Cincinnati. Probably better suited to be a left fielder than a right fielder, but he can definitely play both. And he is currently in AAA, just tearing things up. 873 OPS with 337 ABs for the Salt Lake Bees. And Adele just really hasn't gotten much of a shot at the big league level. He's had a couple cups of coffee here in the major leagues, but we are going to have him in the big leagues, and he is going to be playing every day here for us to the end, for the rest of the season. Then there was also Matt Feiss. It is actually pronounced Feiss. It's not Tice. It's not anything different. It's Feiss. I do know that because he is from New Jersey. He is a first baseman, third baseman, slash catcher. B potential, but he is 27 years old. And like I said, he is from New Jersey. Went to Jackson Memorial High School in Jackson, New Jersey, obviously. Drafted in the first round out of Virginia. And he's got some good pop. Good plate discipline, but he's got the positional versatility of the corner infield plus catcher. Just another guy who hasn't really ever gotten a shot in the big leagues, a legitimate shot in the big leagues with the Angels. And he is currently putting up solid numbers in AAA, so we're going to take him off our take him off their hands, and he's going to come play up in the big leagues for us. And then the third piece of the trade was Landon Marceau. With a name like that, you could have guessed he went to the Louisiana State University. He was a Tiger down in the SEC. He is a six foot nine right-handed pitcher. C potential guy, still only 23 years old though. He could be a guy who turns into a bottom half starter. That's the thing about these C potential guys is you never really know what they're going to be. They could just literally have one like half of a year where they're good and boom, they're all of a sudden B potential and they're just looking like they could be a stud for us. And even guys who were never even moved from a C potential, those C potential guys, they're no slouches. They can develop pretty well. It's happened many times in my series throughout the years. But now moving on to the next trade, James Paxton, the Big Maple, moved on to the San Diego Padres. He's been shipped off there, and in return, we get left-handed pitcher Ryan Weathers and right-handed pitcher Eric Ryder. San Diego is currently three and a half games back in the wild card, and they are in need of starting pitching. They've got Syndergaard and Blake Snell. Mackenzie Gore is still very young, so it kind of really falls off after that, like, two-ish, three-ish sort of area in the rotation. Now, Ryan Weathers is the son of longtime big league reliever David Weathers. He was a first-round pick a few seasons ago of the Padres. And he's only really had one season in the big leagues, and he wasn't really that great. But he has been fantastic in AAA this season. Obviously, another left-hander that we are adding to our team, which we do have quite a bit of, but... I'm not a guy who's going to be like, oh, we have too many lefties. We can't perform with too many lefties. It's If you have good pitchers, they're good pitchers. Now, he will be in the bullpen to start, but he could move to the rotation at some point. Definitely has the uh, stamina to be like a guy who's not going to work deep in a ball game, but could definitely give you like five starts, every, five innings like every time that if he really wanted to. But I do also like the idea of him being a multi-inning relief pitcher. While the other guy we picked up, Eric Ryder, is one of San Diego's picks from last year's draft. He's a right-handed pitcher, and he might be getting a prospect profile, so we're not going to go too in-depth on him here. So now on to the next trade of the other starting pitcher in Luis Castillo. This is a one-for-one -one deal. He is being sent to the Bronx. He's going to be towing the slab in the boogie down from here on out, playing for the New York Yankees. Obviously, the Yankees are always looking to improve. They're always looking to buy at the deadline. There is never a deadline where the Yankees aren't in on the best guys available. 
And if you ask their fan base, they will just simply trade Miguel Andujar this trade deadline for Juan Soto in real life. But in this universe, they will be giving up one of their better prospects. But he is also a guy who is kind of shoved down on the depth chart and definitely behind a couple guys in their system, especially their top prospect in Anthony Volpe. We will be getting Trey Sweeney, who actually was their first round pick in 2021. He will be getting a prospect profile at some point. I'm not sure exactly when, but he will be getting one at some point, so we're not going to go too in-depth on him either. So let's move things on to the lesser trades. There was John Birdie, who, like I mentioned in the previous video, he is a guy who is having a career year. It's just unfortunately that the, the way the trade value in this game looks, it just pretty much looks at what your potential rating is and what position. So like, if you're a C potential utility guy, you're a C potential utility guy, it doesn't matter how good you're performing. So he doesn't have the biggest trade value, but we still managed to get something out of him. John Birdie being sent to the Philadelphia Phillies because they still have not fixed their issue where they have no center fielder. Birdie can absolutely play center field for them. They are three and a half games back in the wild card, but it's also not like they're giving up a ton. It's not like they're they're trying to trade us for a top prospect for John Birdie. They're just giving us a guy who's basically organizational filler. So they get John Birdie. We get Ethan Lindau, 24-year-old left-handed pitcher. C potential, once again, never know what can happen to these C potential guys. All it takes is like a good year, a good half year, and boom, all of a sudden they're a B potential. They're a legitimate dude in the system. And of course, we are also in this rebuilding phase, and we are trying to strengthen our minor league system here. So basically what we're really trying to do here is we are acquiring assets. We are trying to just strengthen our team with young guys throughout the system and just give ourselves a best chance of developing studs in our minor league system. And then the final trade we made was Jonathan VR. I did mention that I was possibly going to trade him if he was still on fire heading into the deadline, and guess what? He's still on fire. He is really starting to turn things around here, so we're going to be giving the Atlanta Braves a bench bat for the second time. We give them uh, Donovan Solano last season. We got Delano to Shields for him. Uh, obviously, the Delano to Shields didn't really do much for us, but this time we are going to be getting... Seth Elledge, a right-handed reliever. He is 26 years old, went to Dallas Baptist University. Decently hard thrower, has a nasty slider, very good at limiting hits and getting strikeouts. Atlanta currently has him sitting in AAA, definitely not going to get really any time in their organization, so we're going to have him come over to Cincinnati and see what he can do for us. So now let's take a look at what the Cincinnati Reds team looks like here post-trade deadline. And we did actually make one more move, but it wasn't a trade. It was actually DFAing Whit Merrifield. Unfortunately, he had the two great catches. He had some decent hits in games earlier in the season. Unfortunately, he has not performed well, though, this year, and definitely not well enough to warrant being traded. So nobody's going to want to trade for numbers like that. So instead, we're just going to be DFAing him and releasing him to open up spots for other guys to get time here in the second half of the season. So now if we take a look at what the rotation looks like here in the big leagues, Joey Murray, Zach Godley, and Brandon Williamson have all been called up from the minor leagues. Now, if you look at the rotation, obviously, you're going to be looking at that and you're like, oh, do you think that Hunter Green and Nick Lodolo are, are worse than these three guys? No, they're simply putting into spots. They're just being put into spots in the rotation that are open. We're not going to all of a sudden have Hunter Green change days that he's starting and just get absolutely thrown out of whack. That's not how things work. So we're just inserting guys into spots where they can fit into those spots. But a little background on a couple of them. Joey Murray is a C-potential guy we signed in the offseason this past year. He went to Kent State, so he's an Ohio guy, obviously. Has been great in AAA this year, so he's being rewarded with some time in the big leagues here and see if he could possibly be like a bottom half of the rotation sort of guy. We know about Zach Godley. He was in last year's minor league update video. Had a great season in AAA. I brought him back here for this season. And he's had a good season in AAA once again. So he is also being rewarded with some time in the big league rotation for us. He has had some time uh, in the big leagues with Arizona the past few seasons. Or, or in the past, I should say. And he has had some decent seasons with them. It's just, you know, now he's like 
in his 30s and definitely not a guy who really has a, a huge future in front of him, but he could be a guy who gets some spot starts in here and there, and he is a guy who is going to be in the rotation for us the rest of the year here on out. And then obviously we know Brandon Williamson, lefty. We did a prospect profile on him earlier this season. And then if we take a look at the bullpen, the new guys in the bullpen at the big league level are Ryan Weathers and Seth Elledge, who we just got at this deadline, and then Josh James is being called up from AAA Louisville. Josh James is a guy we signed this previous offseason. He was a starter, but we have moved him full-time to the bullpen because that's, like, that, that's where I feel like he's probably suited best. And he was performing quite well in AAA, so he is also being called up to the big leagues here. And then Lucas Sims is just being slotted back into the closer role, obviously not having a great year, but we're just throwing him there just because who else are we going to throw there? It doesn't really matter. We're a bad team. We're not trying to win games anyways. And then as far as the lineup goes, we have Joe Adele, who is going to be playing every day in right field against both sides. Nick Senzel now moves to left field, and then Matt Theis is actually playing third base. And then Jake Fraley has been called up from AAA as well to be on our bench. I actually would have really thought hard about calling up Ellie De La Cruz, but unfortunately, he has actually fractured his hand, so he's probably going to miss the rest of 2023, along with Nolan Jones. And as far as what the other teams did at the trade deadline, there really weren't too many notable ones, but a couple ones were the Miami Marlins traded Victor Victor Mesa and another prospect to the Colorado Rockies for Sam Hilliard, while the Padres traded C.J. Abrams to San Francisco for starting pitcher Kyle Harrison. They had Abrams on the trade block, I knew that. I, I knew he was probably going to get traded at the deadline because they had him on the trade block, and that's generally usually what happens if they put a prospect on there. Trades that we look at and go, oh, that's kind of dumb, are going to happen. They happen in real life. They happen in this game a ton. I'm not going to spend all my time worrying about what CPU teams are doing, because once we get, like, you know, even into next year, and then potentially a lot of seasons into this series, you know, teams are going to look different. Do I really care if C.J. Abrams gets traded in Season 4? I mean, if C.J. Abrams still isn't a Major League player in, in three seasons from now in real life, I mean, if he gets traded, it's not really like, oh my god, they traded a top prospect. It's more like, oh, they traded a guy who still hasn't figured it out. But probably the biggest trade that happened at the deadline was Liam Hendricks. He was traded in the offseason to the Royals. Now the Royals are trading him to another division team in the Minnesota Twins. They get two prospects in return. He's just being passed around the AL Central, essentially. And then the Pittsburgh Pirates also made a trade. They acquired Ryan Yarbrough from the Tampa Bay Rays in return for Rodolfo Castro. So now post-trade deadline, the Cincinnati Reds head out to Milwaukee to take on the Brewers at American Family Field and making his major league debut for the Red Legs is going to be the left-hander Brandon Williamson out of TCU. Take a look at Williamson's stats this season in AAA with Louisville. A little bit of a high ERA and 19 starts down there, but still getting the call up here to the big leagues. And he will be opposed on the day by one of the Brewers' aces in Brandon Woodruff, having a great season with a 2-1-6 ERA. Take a look at the Reds' lineup on the day, listed 1-2-9. And we'll start things off the bottom half of the first inning where Williamson picks up his first career Major League strikeout as Garrett Mitchell is a pair of shoes up there. So it starts off well for Williamson, but it would not continue to go well. Colton Wong comes up and smacks a ball into center field for a base knock. Gets a runner on here with one out. Next batter up is Luis Arias, and he's going to ground one through the whole left side. Back-to-back -back base knocks for the Brew Crew, and then it would bring up Willie Adamas, who's going to power one out to right center field. That's going to get up against the wall, and the Brewers are going to take a 1-0 lead here as the second run tried to come in, but the relay throw gets him at the plate. So two down in the inning, and then Williamson would get out of the inning as Rowdy Telez lines one over to Joe Adele in right field. Move things on bottom of the third. It is Garrett Mitchell again, ground ball up the middle. Jonathan India cannot handle it. That's going to be an error on him. So Mitchell on first base. Hit and run here. Colton Wong slaps it in the left field where there's no fielder. And it's going to be first to third for Garrett Mitchell on the single from Colton Wong. And then Arias powers one out to right center field. And this one's going to not hit off the wall. It's going to go over the wall. 
as the beer makers are now up four nothing here in Milwaukee. Not going well for Brennan Williamson. Trying to get some innings out of him here. They leave him in, but then he gives up another home run on the inning. This one to Willie Adamas. Kiermaier gives it a leap, but it's not going to be a, enough as that does go over the fence. Five nothing lead now for the beer makers. And we'll move things on to the bottom of the fourth where Ryan Weathers came on here for Cincinnati, making his second appearance with his new ball club. And he would start things off by getting a ground ball over to first base. Christian Yelich, that's one down. Next batter up is Victor Caratini. Chops one over to third, and that's going to be two down as Matt Theis makes the play. And then he would complete the 1-2-3 inning first inning of work by striking at Corey Ray on the up and in fastball. We will now move things on to the top of the sixth inning. Checking in with the Reds' bats on the day, down 5 nothing, Trying to rally here, Nick Senzel draws himself a walk to lead off the inning. Next batter up, Jonathan India, is going to slap one into right field. That's going to land in, and it's going to allow the runners to move up an extra base. So second and third here. Now for the Reds, brings up J.D. Martinez. He's going to hit one to deep left field, but not deep enough to get out. It will be a sack fly, though, as the runners will tag up, and the Brewers are now only up 5-1 to one as the Reds do tack on a run. And then Joey Votto hits a ball to deep center field, and that's going to be another sack fly as the runner from third, and India will tag up, and it's now a 5-2 to two game. So only a three-run lead here for the Brewers. Brad Boxberger came on in the top of the eighth inning, and with J.D. Martinez at the plate, hits a ball to left field, and this one is out of here. A two-run blast, or a, a solo shot with two outs, I should say, makes it a five-to-three game. It's now only a two-run lead here for the Brewers. And then Devin Williams came on to close things out in the ninth inning. Looking for the save here with one out. Joe Adele, welcome to the new team here as he powers one to left field. This one's going to hit off the part of the foul pole that is somehow not a home run. And he uses his fleet feet to get into third base with a triple. So he's immediately 90 feet away from scoring and then it would be Matt Theis hitting a ball to left field that's going to tag up Adele and it's all of a sudden a one run game as he just barely gets in past the tag so now with two down the run, the tying run comes up to the plate and it is going to be Jake Fraley coming on to pinch hit here for the Reds recently called up from AAA Louisville and he would just proceed to strike out cannot work a productive at, at bat and the Brewers do hold on to win this game 5-4 over the Reds here in Milwaukee. Player of the game honors go to Willie Adamas of the Beer Makers in this game. He went two for three in the day with a home run and a double. Luis Arias had a three-run home run. Martinez and India each had a double for the Reds. Joe Adele had a triple in the ninth inning, while Brennan Williamson only worked three innings in his Major League debut, gave up seven hits and five earned runs. Not the start he was hoping for, but Ryan Weathers was very impressive out of the bullpen. Worked four scoreless innings in relief, only gave up one hit and struck at two Brewers batters. Now the Reds will travel back home to Cincinnati here at Great American Ballpark as they're going to be playing host to the New York Yankees in some interleague action here. Hunter Green making his 23rd start here, the flame-throwing right-hander for the Reds, and opposing him will be another young right-hander in Luis Heal, making his 23rd start for the Bronx Bombers. Take a look at the Reds lineup on the date listed 1-9. to We'll start things off top half of the first inning where Hunter Green had it working. He strikes at Corey Dickerson with two, with, to make it two outs, and then he would get the slider chasing John Carlos Stanton to go down for the third out of the inning. Move things on top of the second. It's old friend Tyler Naquin going down on the up and in fastball. The high cheese getting blown right by him. And then it's Glaber Torres chopping one up the middle. And Jorge Mateo flips to second base for a 6 4 3 double play to end the inning. Top of the third. How about another ground ball here? 6 4 3 once again. That's two down the inning. Nothing else would happen in the inning. So now we're on to the bottom of the third. Kevin Kiermeyer is going to draw a leadoff walk here at the bottom of the order to send things back to the top. And Jake Fraley leading things off on the day at the plate now. Kiermeyer goes and swipes second base, puts himself in a scoring position. And then Fraley pokes the ball in the right field. Kiermeyer is going to hold up at third base, though. 
So runners on the corners here for the Reds, as then Fraley tries to swipe second base, but instead he's gunned down at second. So now one down, runner on third. India still at the dish. Ball gets away from the catcher, Trevino. That allows Kiermaier to come in on the passed ball. And the Reds strike first in this game, 3-0. Jonathan India would then be unfortunately unable to pull the trigger as he's a pair of shoes up there. Goes down for the second out. And then J.D. Martinez comes up and he rips one down the left field line. That's going to roll slowly to the left field wall. And it's a two-bagger there for J.D. Martinez, the D.H., but then on second base, unfortunately, Joey Votto would not be able to drive him in as he hits a deep fly to left field, but not deep enough as John Carlos stands there to put it away. But then in the bottom of the fourth, Joe Adele going and gapping right center field. That's going to get up against the wall, rounding third, trying to go for three here, but the relay throw was perfect. They get him at third, gunned down, trying to stretch a triple. So nothing going for the Reds there in that inning. Check things back in with Hunter Green as he strikes that old friend Tyler Naquin again. And then to end the inning, it would be DJ LeMayhew chasing the slider. The 1-0 lead remains as Hunter Green continues to be dominant on the day. Davey Garcia came on for the Yankees in the sixth inning. Emma J.D. Martinez at the plate. He's going to bloop one into or line drive one in the left field, but John Carlos Stanton cannot make the diving play is what I should say. And then with Martinez on first, Tyler Stevenson going to bloop one into right field. And even J.D. Martinez is going to go first to third on this. Stevenson moves up to second on the throw. So two runners in scoring position here with two hats for Joe Adele. And he's going to smack a ball to, right, to the right side. Glaber Torres diving stop, but not enough to get the runner at first. So a run comes in. It's now a 2 nothing game. Nothing else would happen in the inning for the Reds. Miguel Sano, the first baseman for the Yankees in this season, goes down looking and then also Tyler Naquin for the third time this game goes down on strikes so now move things on to the top of the eighth where Seth Elledge came on here for the Reds the former Dallas Baptist University reliever and he is going to strike at the batter to end the inning now we're on to the top of the ninth and Lucas Sims came on to shut the door back in the closer spot and he is going to do just that gets Corey Dickerson to go down looking as it's now a 3-0 final score as the Reds win this one here at home at Great American Ballpark. Hunter Green was your player of the game in this one. Pitched seven very strong innings, only gave up two hits, struck out eight Yankees batters, and then gave up no runs, and he only walked two batters as well. And then on the hitting side of things, Joe Adele went three for four on the day. He had a double, then got thrown out at third, trying to stretch that into a triple, obviously, but still a three for four day. Very solid performance at the plate for the newly acquired Cincinnati Red. But really, it was the pitching that showed out on this day as the Reds hold the Yankees to two hits on the day. And with that being said, it's going to wrap things up here for this edition of the Cincinnati Reds franchise here on MLB The Show 22. I've been your host, Jerseyborn, and I am saying, Griffin Dorshing is a scary, scary man. <laughs> <laughs>